to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. As promised, today is the final episode that we are rebroadcasting from the Barbell Logic Military Series. And this one is focused on the military fitness culture. It's an interview that I did with Matt Reynolds talking about what is the arc of experience, the arc of physical fitness development for someone who comes into the military, how are they developed over time, and you know what is the responsibility of big military, big air force or whoever toward that person, but also their responsibility ensuring that they are meeting the stipulated requirements for them to stay in the military and be effective. Yeah, exactly. It's almost as if, you know, the other episodes were more tactical. We're moving to the operational and strategic view of fitness in the military. So always good to do that type of analysis when you're looking at hard problems. You know, don't just look at the weeds and the tactics and the problems that you've got at the tactical level. You got to think about the big picture and how it all fits in. I think this is a good opportunity. I think you did a good job with Matt exploring this. And there's some things we're going to comment on the end. Other than that, I think we should turn it over to you two. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, let's do it. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast, another episode of the military series. And I'm joined again by Colin Slade, who is a block staff member, staff coach for us on the sales team as well. And really one of our primary people on staff who connect with military services. And so you're also a captain in the Air Force. I know you did seven years of active duty and you're currently a reservist. This is the second time you've been on the podcast for the series. So welcome back to the show. Thank you. Excited to be here. We want to talk a little bit today about kind of the general arc, like kind of what the fitness life line looks or lifetime arc looks like for your military member and maybe what is common or normal and also what we think might even be better. Although I think that things are a changing for the better anyway, so they're moving in the right direction. Let's start there. Like, what is, what have you seen and what do you know in picking the brains of other military members that, what does this fitness art sort of look like? Yeah, it's a really good thing for us to consider when we're looking at the requirements to serve in the military to begin with, right? Sure. That's where this kind of all begins is that what we call the accessions process or the recruiting process. And so anybody that wants to come into the military, they must meet very specific guidelines before they're ever allowed to put the uniform on, right? Sure. And so we've covered those standards throughout this podcast series, but I want to emphasize the point that those physical requirements, those are required by law. So it is written into US code title 10 that anybody who wants to serve in the military must meet certain physical and medical requirements. Now the exact requirements, they are not stipulated in the law itself. Rather, each of the different services are given the ability, the flexibility to define what those fitness requirements are going to be. But when you're talking about bringing in hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of people into the military every single year, then what you are able to measure them on has to be something that is scalable across an entire organization, right? And so that usually means that you're going to measure them on something that is very simple to do. Sure. That doesn't require a lot of equipment, that's cheap and easy to assess. And the other thing to consider is that when these requirements were first put into place, you know, back in the, the 1960s and 70s, the culture of fitness just in general within the country was in a very different place then than it is now. People were very into the running era, the calisthenics, that sort of thing. And so that became kind of like the de facto default answer for the accessions and recruiting processes. Let's measure people's ability to run and do push-ups and do 
sit-ups or crunches, pull-ups in some circumstances. And so the health and fitness arc of the military member begins there by being recruited into the military. They run, they do push-ups and sit-ups, and if they are able to pass those requirements, then they can start the rest of their military journey and the fitness that goes along with it. So there's a base standard that they have to meet to even enter in and go to basic training. Is that? Yep. And then I assume there's a goal over the course of basic training to improve fitness as well over the course of of that. So is it the same PFT that the, you know, an 18 year old kid fresh out of high school hasn't actually officially started boot camp or basic yet? Is it the same PFT that he's subjected to or she's subjected to before they go in that they're going to continue to be tested on throughout the life of their career? Yeah, for the most part, there will be some additional fitness standards depending on the career field that they're going to go into. Like, for example, if they want to go into special operations, they're going to have a much higher fitness standard to do those things as opposed to the rest of the force. Yeah, I get it. I remember, you know, seeing kids when I was a, a high school teacher kids that knew that they were going to go in the military. And a lot of times they would be in ROTC in high school and they would be trying to practice some of these skills, different skills that they would have to acquire or or needed to know to kind of give them a leg up before they went to basic. And one of the things that they would do is obviously they would practice these things. They would be doing push-ups all the time. They'd be doing runs as a group, a group of high school kids in preparation for going off and serving in the military. And so they start there, right? Or And I'm sure a lot don't, a lot just start having not been in ROTC or anything that prepped them. Yeah. And then what does the process kind of look like? What do you see over the life of the military member? I mean, do they just, I'm asking, do the majority of the members in the military tend to continue to gravitate deeply into running, cardiovascular fitness, you know, body weight work, or over time, are we seeing more and more often them transition more into understanding the need for strength training or anything else, anything that's even outside of those basic standards? Yeah, I would say that there is a balance of both. And here's where I think that the military fitness culture is at, that once you pass those initial standards, you have graduated your accession source, be that a basic military training, basic combat training, or you go through a commissioning program to become an officer. Once you've graduated, the deliberate development of your physical fitness stops. Hmm. The military no longer makes the effort to try and grow your ability to be physically fit. Now, there will still be certain events or activities organized around fitness, like the units will do a unit PT, everybody will get together and go on like a fun run, a ruck march, or something along those lines where something that you can do as a large group, again, that's pretty cheap. and Yeah, and that you're going to run at the speed of the slowest yeah, person. for sure. Right, so you've got one guy that's, <laughs> that's dying, and most of the other rest of the group is like, we're just trotting along here. It's not that yeah, big of a deal. Yeah, just wasting their time, really, because they could yeah. be using that time to do something else. But these types of mandatory events, everybody has to be there, right? Sure. And so, like what I was saying is the deliberate development of the physical fitness stops. And so people will gravitate toward the thing that they are good at or the thing that they uh, enjoy or just the thing that's available to them. So if they're on a base that has a fully stocked gym with racks and bars and all of those things, people will act, will go and use them. You know, there are functional fitness centers across installations throughout the DOD that get very well utilized. And people get the benefit from it. However, there's still such a holdover from that cardio and calisthenics culture so that within those same gyms, you're also going to see a thousand treadmills and all of the cable machines and stuff like that. So really, members of the military get to choose from this smorgasbord of whatever they want to do as long as the installation makes it available to them. Sure. That makes sense. And then they continue to still have to be tested on their branches version of the PFT. Right. Every year, is it tend to be like once a year? Is that average? Yeah, that's the typical cycle for testing is every year or so. So one of the arguments I think that you're gonna make and that we've made some on the series as a whole is that we take care in, in Barbell Logic is to make sure that we are still training our military members to really do well on the PFT, to crush the PFT. Right to continue to improve based on the standards because they're tied back to rankings. I mean, you know, this is, it's important to be able to continue to improve while at the same time trying to understand what are the real needs of a 
military member, of a soldier, of a Marine, of an airman, right, of a sailor, what are their physical needs? And so really, and I realize that for people listening in here, there's probably a little bit of a duh sort of moment, but let's take just a second and talk about like, why is fitness such an important component for employment at all? Like, what is the main focus? And again, I think if I ask that question to people who are civilians in general, they're gonna be like, well, like, obviously you gotta be in shape to be able to, you know, be a right. soldier, but it actually really comes back to readiness, right? Like that's really what the military is trying to do. Yeah, absolutely. So you asked the question, why does the military need to be fit? Because we don't know what's coming. We need to be prepared for the unexpected, whatever that means. And in a position where we can succeed, regardless of the environment that we have to fight in. Now, the biggest part of the military, the vast majority of people are not going to be in combat. And that's fine, sure. right? They're in support roles. They're enabling those frontline soldiers, Marines, sailors, airmen, whatever, to go and take the fight to the enemy. But they still need to have a baseline of fitness in order to be capable in their jobs, some of which are very physical. Some are not. They're more of like the knowledge ops, desk work you know, sort of thing. But it, even in those kinds of situations, we want to make sure that the members of the military are not going to be a drag on the system. We've seen, you know, just in the corporate world, that people who are not physically fit are not as good at doing their job and are often a risk to the business because they're far more likely to get injured just in day-to-day -day life. And so that removes them from the ability to do their job. And that is then going to have a follow-on effect down the support and logistics line. Somebody missing from their desk job may be the difference between success or failure on the front lines in the military. And so we, we don't sure. have just an unlimited number of bodies that we can throw at all of these problems. We need everybody who wears a uniform to be on their A game at all times. And being physically fit, mentally fit, you know, spiritually and, and mentally resilient is part of all of that. And deliberately training somebody and developing that level of fitness over the course of a career is absolutely critical to it. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the most simple ways to achieve that thing, right? I mean, from a perspective of doing that kind of voluntary hardship thing, we can't and don't want to just set someone in a combat scenario having not gone through other hard things to prepare them. That's what the military is doing when you're not in combat scenarios. You're preparing them to be in these like really hard periods of time. And so what better, and not just that, and so not even just to be on a singular personal level ready, but also what sort of things outside of combat build more camaraderie and morale and connection as a group and trust than training exactly. together, right? This is a thing that we know improves for everybody. And this is an argument we've made for years, obviously not just for the military, for literally everybody, for that executive, business executive, for the mom, for the dad, for the husband, for the wife. It just is a general thing. And I know you and I have talked, you know, offline lots of times before. We have many similar value systems. I know that strength training is not the single most important thing in the whole world, right? There are other things that are more important. Like my relationship with my wife and my kids and the way I interact with my community is more important than my strength training. But my strength training makes all those other things right. better, especially if I do it for the right reasons, right? If I'm doing it so that I can be healthy and strong and resilient and those things. And so obviously my needs as in doing strength training, there is a standard for me that is entirely personal. Right. But the standards for the military member become far greater because what you're doing is far greater than oneself. Like you are literally here to defend the United States of America. Yeah. And so there is a real need there to make sure that these military members are combat ready. So what I continue to hear from in having these conversations with especially, you know, high ranking officers is that PFT really does matter. And it matters because they have to meet the standards. But what matters even above that is we want combat readiness, because when someone isn't combat ready, when someone is injured, when someone is hurt, it actually pulls them completely away yep. from the group, the company, the battalion, whatever they're in. It puts them in medical. They can't build the camaraderie and the teamwork and the trust. They're not able to continue to improve their skills. And so it becomes a real problem. So I think one of the first places we argue for strength training, because I don't think the military ever really cares that much about how much your squat is or how much your deadlift is, but it, it's actually comes back to that resilience piece, yep. right? Like we see that people who strength train correctly 
get injured far less than people who don't. Yeah, absolutely. The argument that you're making about these things being true for the business world is absolutely correct. That people who are injured, are sick, are incapable of doing their job, they can't connect with the people in their company either, right? They can't That's help right. the business move forward. But the difference between the private business world or the nonprofit world versus what we do in the military, and you could also extend this to law enforcement, first responders, that sort of thing. Sure. The price or the cost of getting this wrong, of somebody being injured or not able to participate in the business of projecting power, participating in combat, that sort of thing, the stakes are far more higher. The cost sure. is far greater, right? I mean, when you're dealing with life and death type of situations, you want to make sure that everybody who is involved in it, from the front line all the way to the person who's pushing papers back at the base, is 100% ready at all times to support that effort. Yeah, that's good. So I think what I've heard you say and what I've heard others say on the series is that the reasoning behind the need for fitness for the military is good. It's well-intentioned. Yes. They want these members of the military to be combat yep. ready. And then there are these standards that say, like, these are some of the fitness standards that we think you need. And again, we may not entirely agree with all of those, certainly. Well, but, we agree that there should be a standard. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. So it's that, could there be better standards? But I'm also, I don't know how much the Pentagon's going to listen to me and say, let's, or whoever is going to listen to me and say, let's change the standards. But so my next question is, maybe more importantly is, if they recognize correctly that combat readiness is the most important thing and that physical fitness is extremely important and a huge part of combat readiness, the question is, what are they actually doing about it? to make sure that our military members are where they need to be to be combat ready. Yeah, I mean, like I mentioned earlier, the deliberate development of the military member, of the individual, stops as soon as they graduate and come into the military, right? But even with that, there have been awakenings within the military, and we've addressed some of those within this podcast series, that some of the branches are making changes and skewing things towards the development and the testing of strength. And that's a good thing. That's wonderful for the military. That's good for the American people, right? But it needs to be greater. There needs to be more, right? They need to scale this across an entire United States Armed Forces, across the entire DOD. And the way that we get there, yeah, there can be this top-down deployment of new standards, you know, such as the Army's new ACFT, the Army Combat Fitness Test, where someone in a back room somewhere came up with these different standards and now they're pushing them out. It's like the trap bar, yeah, trap bar deadlist and, and leg tuck, that we're seeing. Yeah. A medicine ball throw. So better, right. but not quite right, but still like it's a move in the right yeah, direction. We're not going to knock that at all. We no. see that there is value in that, even if they don't test things like we would exactly do it. Right. We're still sure. grateful for the change, but what hasn't happened has been scaling that at the individual level for individual soldiers. And we can see in the tea leaves that this is probably going to be the way that the Air Force goes, maybe the Marines, eventually the Navy might pick up something like this, where there's a far more greater emphasis on the testing of strength than there has been previously. But how do you scale this across the individual? We've talked about this, that the Army and the military as a whole has a logistical problem, right? That they cannot provide individualized coaching to every single person, because that's not what the military is for. That's not what the military is designed to do. Now they try, they will send people to different schools to get like their master fitness training certification, or other things like that, have dedicated people within the military, whether wearing the uniform or contractors or something like that, to provide some instruction, but they're not experts. A weekend sure. seminar or two weeks to earn a certification does not make you an expert coach. Sure. Just like it doesn't make you an expert anything, by the way, <laughs> right. right? Like you can't go to a weekend seminar, you know, and be an expert sharpshooter after a weekend. Like, oh, I'm, I am now an expert. I'm a sniper. <laughs> right. No, we can't do that in three days, right? Like, and that's, what's crazy is it feels like the world fully understands that with most of these issues. Do you think it has to do with strength training specifically? 
and even things like running, which tend to be like, it's like, how hard is it to learn how to run? Well, honestly, like there's a significant amount of form that goes into running to make sure, again, for combat readiness, that we don't get shin splints, that we're not bouncing off our heels. We understand how to push off the ball of our foot. I mean, little things like that. Do you think it's because those things are sort of looked at as a simple, you know, Cro-Magnon sort of like, hey, man, there's the barbell, there's some weights, I don't know, pick it up, put it on your back, squat down, do whatever, yeah. bench press. Like, it's seen as like, do you think people just don't recognize the how much complexity there is for this sort of thing? And they're like, yeah, how hard could it be to learn how to do this stuff in a weekend? Yeah, that is absolutely the case, is that people are just not aware of what it takes to actually get good at one, lifting yourself, like doing sure. the technique with your own body, but then two, being able to teach and coach that to somebody else. They don't yes. realize how difficult that actually is. And yep. so if we want to change the military fitness culture and not just get people, running is still going to be a thing. And sure. I don't want to be the person who says that running should completely disappear. I don't sure. think that it should be tested, but I think that it should still be part of what we do in the military. But sure. if we want to change the culture away from cardio and calisthenics and, and skew it towards the deliberate development of strength over the course of a career, then we not only need to develop the awareness and the desire for change toward that thing on the individual level pursuing that activity, but also for coaching to get the military to recognize that there is value in providing an individualized coaching experience for every single person who wears the uniform. Yep. And that's going to take a lot of effort in order to make that happen. If we want the military to do that, to provide coaching to every single person who is currently serving, then we need to, one, raise the awareness to demonstrate the need for that desire, kindle that fire within them to pursue expert coaching for everybody, and then outline those logistical constraints that we've been talking about, that it's just not feasible for the military to provide internally a coach for every single person and maybe they could figure it out they could throw enough money at it to make that happen but would they be good at it probably not because that's sure. not what the military is for that's not what we do and yeah. so they should outsource that and yes i'm obviously making a pitch here for the services that we provide at barbell logic but it doesn't have to be just us you know there are lots of sure. different ways that this could happen Right, exactly. But they should outsource it like they do many other support elements of the military to expert coaches who actually know how to get somebody strong and also have maybe some of that internal knowledge of what it's like to wear the uniform, hire somebody like me who is currently serving. So I speak the language, I understand the culture, I can help members of the military to achieve that development over the course of a career, right? And not only just hire coaches who are capable of doing that, but then leveraging the technology and the capability of online systems in order to scale that across an entire organization, no matter where they are, who they are, what they're involved in. And so I see that there is a perfect fit for Barbell Logic to support members of the military in this type of endeavor to help them from the very, very beginning of getting into the military, then across an entire career, deployments and all, and then on their way out when they finally decide to take the uniform off to grow their strength and their fitness for that entire life of their time in the military. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I want to I wanna go back for a second and talk a little bit about top down versus bottom up. Because it's been one of the things that we're you know, trying to figure out exactly the right way to do this. It's awfully difficult to break into the top and come top sure. down, especially without the significant amount of hard data that you can take there, that you can take up the ladder and show them that this works. And so one of the things I think that we would love, hey, listen, if you're some four-star general in the army or some other four star in any branch <laughs> if you want to hire us for the entire branch we'll make it happen right we'll figure out the logistics but ultimately i think what we have found and what we are doing is that one of the things that we've been able to do already is we have a significant number of clients already who are individual service members who have hired us on their own dime yep. to train them and so to be able to collect aggregate data on them right not to share specific personal data with anybody, but to be able to collect aggregate data on that to show here's what we've seen from the actual standards that they're 
branch of service has passed down that we want to make sure that they don't just, I don't want to just meet the standards. I want to exceed yeah. and like crush them, right? Because I think it, that's one of the things that makes somebody then look and go, well, what's that person doing? And while at the same time, focusing on strength in order to make sure that we are trying to develop, create an optimal soldier, somebody that I would think of, like that I think most of us would think of as, you know, if I think of like the badass soldier, mm -hmm military member, right? So, you know, you're thinking of the badass. You're thinking of the guy who can, yes, he can go out and run three miles in under 20 minutes and 19 minutes, but also pretty jacked, not 285 jacked, 220 yeah. jacked, right? 220, six foot tall, got muscle on him, has a motor that'll go forever. The kind of guy that, let me actually take it out of the military for a second. We went and did a private seminar a few years ago in a major city for their entire fire yeah. department, big city, major city in Texas. And, you know, their firemen, fire persons across the board were pretty weak. Yeah. Really into CrossFit. By the way, I understand why they were really into CrossFit. I also understand why CrossFit exploded in 2008, 2009. Our military is in Afghanistan and Iraq, and it was like the perfect you know, let's swing ammo cans and we can, we don't even have to have access to yep. all this stuff, right? We can do this thing and we can build camaraderie together and whatnot. But here's what we found. There was this guy, this, this fireman who was like five foot 10 and probably 235 and could keep up with anybody on a cardiovascular fitness run piece, Metcon, and then we did the strength training at the seminar and the guy squatted like 535 for a triple <laughs> and deadlifted 635 for a triple. And I was like, okay, listen. And at one point I just stopped the room and I said, if I'm on the fourth floor of a burning building, that's the guy that I want pulling my body yep. out. The rest of you can't do it. I weigh 285. There is no way, there is not another person in this room who can get my body off of a fourth floor, but that guy can. So when they were like, well, how should we, you know, like ultimately you're getting ready to leave the seminar, like trying to set them up on like, you know, they're asking, how should we train? Where do we go from here? I'm like, do what he's doing. Listen to that guy. He's really smart and knows what he's doing. Like he has decided to set the standards so far beyond whatever the fire person standards are for that specific city. And I think that there is certainly, we can start to make a splash on, and it's far easier and has a far lower barrier to entry to be able to reach out to individual service members and go, hey, here's the thing. We can coach you at Barbell Logic. And, and again, there are certainly other places who can coach you well, and there are other great expert coaches that aren't just us, so we're not trying to have a monopoly there. That's not what we're saying. But one of the things that I love about Barbell Logic is that, and what we've seen has been a positive impact for these service members, is that they can literally train anywhere they mm -hmm. want, anytime they want, right? They're moving around all the time. They're in three different cities in the United States over the course of an 18 month period. Yep. Then they get overseas. They're in Germany for a while. And then they're in the Middle East. And here's what we found now, especially, and this wasn't even the case in 2008, 2009, and certainly not before that, but now literally almost anywhere they go, we, you know, we've got guys that are in like sub-Saharan Africa and they ship these shipping containers to where they are. And the shipping containers are full of gym yeah. equipment, like a CrossFit rig. And they pull the rig out and they mount it to the outside of the shipping container and the weights and the bars on the inside of the shipping container. And they can literally, they can squat, they can deadlift, they can bench press, they can press. And of course, we can do high intensity interval yeah. training and train their cardiovascular system. We can do the body weight work. We can do chins and dips and push ups and sit ups and all the things that they should do. And the other thing that's crazy with technology is almost everybody has access to a cell phone and cell phone service. Yep. I've gone in the middle of nowhere Haiti before. I mean, Haiti. And I still can stand up on a roof and I have cell phone service and I could upload my workout. And so it's been really cool that like, okay, it doesn't matter if they're in San Diego or if they're like where they're stationed and if they're in Provo, Utah, if they're in Germany, if they're in, you know, God knows where in the Middle East, they can continue to do this. And so it provides some continuity across their career to be able to do it. So I think for us, one of the things we're trying to do is both try to reach the individual service member from the bottom yes. up so that we can provide these stats and these data and show like, listen, and they don't get hurt. They're not, what's it called? The brig? Is that the, <laughs> ho what's the hospital? So it's, am I showing my ignorance here? So <laughs> whatever, you know, they don't get hurt. They don't get injured. They don't get pulled out. The of, brig is a prison. <laughs> what's the hospital? What's that called? 
medical? The, is the there clinic. Like a, oh, there's not a term? Dang it, I want there to be a term. For, <laughs> maybe, I'll, maybe I'll work on inventing the term for the... Anyway, okay, so we don't want them to go to the bridge. That's definitely <laughs> true. But also don't want them to go to the hospital. <laughs> so, so, and we work from the bottom up, right? And then here's my next question is, what is the smallest unit? And I know they have different names and yeah. different different right so is it like company battalion platoon yeah or like company what, or flight or platoon or, or something squad something like that is that you know again there is i think for our service members listening who have already bought into this i think one of the biggest impacts that they can make is to begin to gather workout partners you have access to this yeah. stuff train with the people you train with like that's the idea and one of the advantages that scott conway talked about in our interview was that you know, you talked about that going on a group run, on a group ruck, right? Yep. One guy is getting a good workout out of that deal, the slowest one. And everybody else is like, we're just, it's, we're just building morale, right? Yeah. It's just, it's really a morale building event, not a real true physical fitness event. But that same group can train together in the gym. Mm -hmm. And one guy can be squatting 405 and another guy can be squatting 145. And they all can train as hard as they can train together. Right encourage each other, spot each other, cheer each other on. By the way, have great competition. I think it's healthy competition. I think the military lends itself to that, right? Yep. So one of the reasons that we see this fit so well is that most military members understand there's some level of understanding of their need for strength training. And you've got a mostly, I realize there are certainly plenty of females at this point now too, but you've got a bunch of dudes running around, high testosterone, love to compete, and it gives them a great out for yeah. that. And so it builds that morale. So, so what do you think about like the strategy between building from bottom up versus top down, maybe both, maybe shooting, you know, arrows both directions yeah. and seeing if we can meet in the no, middle? You're exactly right. That is spot on. We need both. We need members of the military to recognize the importance of this type of activity and know that it's something that they can get themselves and their unit involved in right now. I mean, there's nothing that's going to limit them from doing it. They just need to get in touch with us, send me an email, and I will gladly take them on as clients and work with the entire unit. Happy to do that. Sure. But that means that they're paying for it out of their own pocket. And when we talk about this being a condition of employment and a requirement for them to be effective in their day-to-day -day job as a member of the military, we don't think that they should be paying for it. We think that the military as a whole should reinforce this type of change through policy and budget, supplying the necessary wickets and financials in order to make this sort of thing happen across the entire military. And so those decisions are going to take place far above the typical military member, right? You know, within sure. that company level, that flight level, that's not where those decisions are going to be made. That's going to happen at at least the battalion or the squadron far more likely it's going to happen at a installation or a wing or a numbered air force, major command, a division or a corps, you know. We're talking like 2,000 to 5,000 people somewhere in that ballpark. Yeah, we're talking about a command structure where there's at least a colonel, an 06 at the top, probably more likely a flag officer, general officer, admiral or something like that. Those are the people who are going to be able to make these kinds of budgetary and policy decisions. But they're not going to do it until they see that there is a return on investment. And so yes. absolutely has to happen at the bottom, but it also absolutely has to happen at the higher levels of the military organization. Right, that makes sense. You know, this kind of stuff is not cheap, and so I can understand why they would wanna see the data to know, they don't wanna take the risk and pull the trigger with taxpayers' money, not knowing if there's actually gonna be a return on investment. And so I think that's why the individual soldier, the smaller units, even, you know, seven, eight, 10 people within a specific unit training together, and making sure that we've got good data, one of the things I love about what we're able to do is we're able to collect such good aggregate data. And again, protecting the individual all the time, not sharing individual data, yeah. but that, and the more people we have to do this, the better the aggregate data is, right? If you've got a pool of, well, here's what three people did, well, like, okay, that could be outliers. But, you know, at the point that you can go, well, here's 100, yep. here's what we've done with 100 service members and it's made a big difference, then all of a sudden you can start to make the splashes up the ladder, I think. And we already have that 100, that that yes. large number of members of the military who, like you said earlier, are spending their own money on doing this. I mean, take me as an example. I've been a client 
with Barbell Logic since May of 2017. And so yep. I have my entire training history in the Barbell Logic system, and you can see for sure the, the progress that I have made over those almost four years now. I'm yeah. far stronger, far more healthy, far more capable in my day-to-day -day responsibilities because of the time that I have spent working with the coach, who, by the way, is also a member of the military or was at one point. Was. And so yeah. you take my individual example and you scale that across hundreds. And now we have that aggregate data that we can share with those decision makers at the highest levels of the military to say, yes, this works. And we would love to partner with the Army, with the Air Force, with the Marines, the Navy, Coast Guard, Space Force, you know, you name it. We want to help all of those members of the military to make progress like I have and the rest of our military clients have and scale that across the entire organization. Yeah, that's good. I think being able to provide that data of here are the continued PFT numbers, here are the continued standards that that branch of service has set, here are the progress points for our clients, but also here are their strength improvements, here are their you know waist to height or waist to body weight or waist to neck sort of improvements. Here's the data on the medicalization of or lack thereof medicalization for these, i.e. they've been combat ready the entire time, mm -hmm. right? And you can just start to go down the line and hopefully start to change the thought process, the sort of philosophical idea of helping there to be an understanding of awareness of why we need strength. And as we start to get that, I think then we're able to show one this is why we need to pursue expert coaching because it really is tough to do this and do this right as a matter of fact we've had lots of service members come to us who have already been strength training but have been hurt they've hurt themselves yeah. and one of the things i think we're up against is that when you do this wrong when you do it overboard when you do it with lots of high impact one of the problems that i've argued about crossfit and by the way i am very thankful for crossfit i, I don't want to throw them under the bus yeah. at all they are really the group that exposed thousands and thousands of service members, really even during time of war for us, to barbells and what they could, the benefits that they could have. The downside was there was a lot of high impact stuff. And because you got a bunch of people who compete and compete hard, and again, a bunch of military who are just, their balls to the wall all the time, yeah. they come to us hurt. And then we're able to go, okay, hold on, we can still continue to get you stronger and you don't have to be not only do you not have to be hurt, we're going to make sure that we build up the resilience so that you're not going to get hurt in the future. And I think until we do that, then we're not going to see being able to leverage and reinforce with that policy and budget. But I think once we are, then it's time to start to go, okay, hey, now we can start to reinforce this. Because I agree, these members of the military should not be paying for this out of their own pocket. This is something that clearly has tremendous benefit for our members of the military. We can find common ground and meet in the middle to figure out how can we scale this and train more members of the military so that so that we're not changing the lives of 100 military members, but we're changing the lives of thousands. Yeah. That's doable. Yeah, the military in a whole recognizes that, that there is a need for a change. Like we said, the Army has rolled out the new ACFT. The Air Force is currently looking at making changes to its PT process. And we know that there is a desire even at the highest levels to make these kinds of changes. The problem is, is that they're looking internally to solve it and right. they shouldn't do that. They right. should hire expert coaches who have already solved all of these issues, right. who are leveraging the technology and you know, the military loves technology. That's why they spend, you know, $200 million on an F-35 or a new tank or, you know, even. Which by the way, on a side note, Typically, the militaries, they're not building those things. Right. <laughs> so they will spend the money on the experts. Like, they're not making their own airplanes. I don't think, right? They're not making the rockets. Like, we have these companies that they hire as contractors, but they go, oh, these are the experts. These are where the engineers are, right? They're building the thing and so that we can use the thing. And so it's a great point. To say, I mean, the military spends, oh, yeah. I would assume, billions of dollars every year on contracts on with experts for various fields to build the thing or do the thing that they recognize that that's where the expert yeah. is right it doesn't take a trained soldier to build a rocket ship that's 
that takes an aerospace engineer and actually a team of thousands of aerospace right. engineers. And so they go to Boeing or SpaceX or, you know, whatever. You know, you've got these companies like Lockheed and all these companies over the years that are the contractors. And they go, we recognize that we have to spend some money here to get the thing from the expert. So really one of the things I think we have to do is change the minds of, change the idea of the need for developing fitness and combat readiness in our armed service members to be done by outside experts, yeah. right? It's got to be delegated outside the field. So yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. It's a great point. What happens if it doesn't change? So I think we recognize that this is probably going to come later than we want it to. Like this might be something that takes 20 years down the road to actually achieve. Yeah. And so what happens? What's the fallout if the culture doesn't change? If 10 years from now, 15 years from now, 20 years from now, it's still, we're still putting on our shorty shorts and running together and nobody's, you know, nobody's lifting. We don't have a culture of strength. What's that look like? I mean, the rest of the world is recognizing the value of strength. That is happening. You know, we're seeing this play out across private industry and certainly at the individual level, people pursuing strength for their own benefit. And that's not limited just to people here in the United States. It's happening across the world. And so that includes some enemies of the United States, right? And sure. the you know, some of the one of the big discussions that's going on right now is the return of great power competition and that the United States specifically is looking at near peer rivals like China and Russia and needing to find ways to maintain an advantage over them. Sure. Now, like we were just saying about technology, that's usually the way that the military likes to solve those kinds of problems is, well, we just need more, better, faster technology to make sure that we keep that edge over our enemies. But the human still remains as the limiting factor, right? You know, if sure. you put somebody into the cockpit of a jet, they can only fly so far and so long before right. the body starts to break down and they have to return to base, right? And so there's a possibility here that if we don't change the way that we approach this, that will be the thing that our enemies get right and enables the advantage over us there's a real possibility that we could lose the next war, whatever that war ends up being, whether it's with a near peer rival or it's something similar to you know, what we've been involved with, the global war on terror, whatever the war looks like, there is a possibility we could lose it because the human is the limiting factor in the projection of power. Yeah. And so sure. if we want to prepare ourselves to not lose, just like we've been discussing this whole time, we need to address the human who is involved in whatever use of the technology, whether they're flying a jet, driving a tank, firing a rifle, or back at the base, pushing papers. Everybody needs to be prepared and ready to take the fight to the enemy. Yeah, it's, you know, there's this mindset, I think, that occurs where, and it doesn't just apply to military, but I really believe that it's our job to be the best we can possibly be at the thing we're called to yeah. do. Right. So like if you're a trash man, you better be the best damn trash man on the planet. Like there's no shame in that. I'm not using that as a shameful position. Right. Like what's shameful is cashing it in, is having the job and just, you know, it's like office space. Like, I, you know, I'd, I'd say in an, any given eight hour day, I do about 15 minutes of work. That's the problem. Right. And I'm not saying that that's what's going on in the military. What I'm saying is I think there are these and what I think you're saying is there are some holes or some deficiencies. Yeah that if we can educate the military on those holes, why wouldn't they want to step up and create better, stronger, faster, more resilient, less chance to be injured soldiers, Marines, you know, different military services in the military. So to me, that's a no brainer, right? Like it's the same thing. Like if we found out there was this technology that made things better, we're going to pursue it because it gives us a leg up. So my wonder is, is in the extreme explosion of the technological advancement we've made, especially over the past two decades or so, yeah. if some of the physical advancement has sort of been left to the wayside to go like, mm, it's not that important anymore. And yeah. yet, everybody I know that's gone to Afghanistan or Iraq or needs to land from helicopters to go kill Osama bin Laden, it's still humans kicking indoors. There's still a lot of that going yeah. on. And so, you know, and certainly, and I don't know exactly what it looks like for the Air Force or for the Navy, but I know for the Marines and the Army, everyone is an infantryman. Like, everyone is trained yeah. to be a rifleman, to be in the, like, and I don't know if it's the same in the others, but, like, that's, that's part of, and like you said, there's, like, obviously a huge percentage 
of the soldiers and Marines as they go through their career are not infantrymen, yet they're all trained that right. way because they have to be combat ready when necessary. I mean, there's an argument to be made that the physical fitness standards that we've been talking about are not necessary for the future as they have been in the past. I mean, you take an airman, a computer terminal connected through the internet to the enemy, they can shut down entire electrical grids and you know turn off nuclear test sites or whatever. You can make the argument that one person with a, a computer terminal is far more damaging to the enemy than a Marine with a rifle, right? Sure. But what happens if that one airman or that one person at the computer gets hurt just you know picking up groceries right they can't show up to work right right now you've completely lost that capability and so there's still the argument to be made yeah how important is it for that guy to train and not just about not getting hurt picking up groceries but like what we see this refining power that occurs and it's not i'm really not trying to get philosophical yeah. but this we see this thing that happens when we do things that are voluntarily hard, right? Like when we choose, like, just like you said, you kind of get out of basic, you get out of your basic sort of training and the armed forces are like, Hey, we're not going to keep forcing you. We're not going to train together. Like you're going to have to take the responsibility now to do this thing. But this guy who is sitting at a computer who has tremendous amounts of make tremendous amounts of impact for the good of our country. Like how much more sharp is he that he got up this morning and he squatted and he deadlifted and then did 20 minutes of hit exercise and then came to work sharp ready yeah. focused like that guy's better at his job even if he's not kicking indoors yeah we've made the argument that everybody who is going to wear the uniform who is involved in that support and logistical piece of projecting power needs to be at the top of their game no matter what that yep. should be the baseline right and so we can see that not only is there a huge risk to not doing that in that we could potentially lose a war. But if we flip that on the other side and say, what if everybody is at that level all the time? Hey, maybe there's a potential that our enemies see how freaking capable we are and they don't ever wanna start a war to begin with because sure. they know that that airman who is at that computer terminal is, is the best, is, the best, is strong, right. is capable both physically and mentally and so everyone across the entire organization of the military is ready to fight, then our enemies are going to say, no, thanks. We don't want right. to touch that. Right. What a wonderful benefit of being the best, being understood as the best across the board, holistically, WHO, holistically, in that sometimes it just avoids the fight altogether, yeah. right? which is far better for everyone. So that's awesome. Thank you for this conversation. It's been really good. You know, so if you're listening out there all the way from you know, the kid that's going into basic that's 18 years old, you know, the private all the way up to officers, commanding officers in the army, up to the commander in chief, if you're listening, Mr. President, as well. <laughs> like, we, it probably wouldn't be the first time that the president listened to Barbell Logic podcast. Right? So, you know, we can help. We want to help. And so best way to find you, Colin, you're probably a great person to reach out to, to just, and by the way, this is not as much as really, we want this to be a general understanding of why we need strength, not a commercial for Barbell Logic. And the same will apply if you reach out to Colin. It's not a sales pitch. Colin loves to just talk to people about the need for this thing. And so what's the best way to get a hold of you? Yeah. Send me an email at cslade at barbell-logic.com. It'll be in the show notes. You can reach out to me there. Happy to have the conversation about how to scale strength training to individual members of the military or a unit or an entire force. Yeah. I'd love to help. So. Colin Slade, that's S-L-A-D-E, C Slade at barbell-logic.com. You can also just find him on the website. Pretty easy to find. You can click his emails on there as well. Reach out. And if you have any questions, we'd love to talk to you about it. If you're interested in bringing strength training to your group, whether that's a group of you know five or six people who want to just train together and start to just kick ass and take names, we'd love to help. And then all the way up to any larger groups as well. So thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks for helping be a little bit. Colin is somewhat of a brainchild here and helping us put together this series. So thank you for the yeah, my uh, pleasure for the kind of architecture you've put together in the series and hope you all are getting value out of this. If you have had some value out of this, we'd love for you to do uh, two things. Share it, please, with us, specifically with a service member or somebody who's impacted by this would be wonderful. Share this series with them. And two, we'd always love to have a five-star review. It helps us tremendously just wherever you listen to podcasts, whether that's at 
I think what was called iTunes and is now Apple Podcast or Overcast or Spotify, whatever. Love to have a five-star review there. Say nice things about us. Or you can always email the show and give us a critique as well. We listen to those. We are always trying to get better every single day, every single show. So, hey, thanks for being on the show again, man. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Hey, Colin, really good episode. I liked a lot of the things that you and Matt talked about. I wanted to start with a really basic concept, but we need to get this out there and we need to get it out there quickly. Okay. What is the entire point of fitness in the military? Because I am so sick and tired of having some airmen, you know, get quippy with me when they say, well, why do I need to run a mile and a half? It doesn't help me do my intel job. And I want to throttle them even though I don't. What is the whole goal? Because I think without that context, all of this discussion doesn't make sense. So let's start there. And I think we're going to start with the DOD instruction because believe it or not, it's all kind of based on that, right? Yes, absolutely. Read DOD instruction, DODI 1308.3 from November 2002. So this was a while ago that it was last updated, but it still applies. It says in section four, service members shall maintain physical readiness through appropriate nutrition, health, and fitness habits. Aerobic capacity, muscular strength, muscular endurance, and desirable body fat composition form the basis for the DOD physical fitness and body fat programs. There it is. That is what it is. Yes. So is that thou shalt maintain physical readiness through these various different things. Yes. But from there, read. It is left to the services, the Air Force, the Army, the Marines, the Navy, they're all different to employ that instruction for their own purposes. Yes. So, and that ties back for the Air Force. There's a Air Force Manual 362905, which describes the purpose of the Air Force physical fitness program. And in support of the DOTI. Exactly. In support yep. of the DOD fitness program. Yep. So you have the DOD fitness program. And this manual, its purpose is to create the conditions in the United States Air Force in order to achieve those objectives. And it says in that in paragraph 1.1, so like the beginning, first paragraph, right? it's to motivate all airmen to participate in year-round physical conditioning program that emphasizes total fitness to include aerobic conditioning, again, DODI, muscular mm -hmm. fitness training, again, DODI, healthy eating. It's to create a culture. It's to create an atmosphere where airmen are fit as part of who they are. Yeah, a culture of readiness and availability. It doesn't say availability, but that's really what this is about. Being present in the culture, able to fulfill your responsibility for the Air Force, for the DOD as a whole, and to the people around you. Yes. So to those random airmen who think that the mile and a half run has nothing to do with their job, you're right. It doesn't. What? It doesn't. How dare you, Reed? But it's bigger than that. And I, oh. that's what I, I want people to have that understanding. Yeah. It's about creating a culture of fitness. And so it's under that lens that I think we need to examine where Air Force fitness is, where our Air Force fitness culture is, and start asking some questions. And the first one that I want to pose to the group, to you, this is a, a rhetorical, I don't need an answer, but I think all of us, no matter where we are, we need to ask, where are we in, with respect to fitness being a part of your individual culture, your individual life? Yeah. Is it part of your life? Are you a fit for the Air Force culture? Yes. Are you fit? for the Air Force culture? Yes. And that's a question we all need to be asking ourselves. And because that's the point, right? That's the point of the fitness program is to create a culture of fitness. Mm -hmm. So where are you? Have you become a new being? You know, Colin, we see this question all the time. And again, we love hearing from our audience members. Keep those questions coming. You can reach us at our podcast email account or, you know, on social media. But we see this all the time. What do I need to do to get ready for ROTC, for OTS, for basic training? We see it on forums. And what is one of the first responses every time, Colin? Get fit. Get fit, right? Because unfortunately in our country, so many of us have not had a culture of fitness. The numbers are clear. Right. And so I want everyone to ask themselves that question. 
are you a good fit for the military culture because you have a culture of fitness in your life? Right. You become a fit by being fit. Yes. Yes. That's not circular at all. I love it. No, it's not. <laughs> I know, I know. It's just the words. English English is a fantastic language. But you know what we're getting at, and that's the important thing. And so I really wanted to get that idea out there because it's with that lens, culture of fitness, that we really need to start asking ourselves, well, what is it and what should it be? And Reed, I want to take it one step further and put it into the sphere of officership. We did a whole series on what an officer should be. And in there, we emphasize the importance of trust. And I actually think that fitness is part of that, that if you are a fit person, you become more trustworthy because you are now a better fit for the culture. And so I want to have a quick discussion here about the relationship between physical fitness and your character, fitness and competence, fitness and connection. Love it. Because I think that there is something worth exploring there that helps us better understand how you become fit for the culture. How does fitness show that you are a person of character? For me, this is pretty straightforward. It's an individual responsibility that I have raised my right hand to the square and said, I'm going to you know, be a part of this organization. And part of the cost of entry is maintaining my physical fitness. Yeah. And if I can do that, I am demonstrating my ability to honor the things that I have said I would do, which to me is like wearing your character out front all the time. Yeah. I like to think about it. And I use this all the time as a strength coach for Barbell Logic. My clients, they like to thank me for helping them to become stronger. And I will reply back, I didn't lift the weight. You did. I presented you the opportunity, but it was you who made the effort to show up and do the hard work of moving the weight. Same thing could be true for running or any other physical activity. Nobody else can do it for you. You as the individual demonstrate your character by doing the hard work, yeah. doing the hard thing. So I think that's one of the ways that fitness and character relate there. Yeah, no, I like that. It's really good. And I think that carries over into competence too, because you are the one who is doing the work, you become more competent. It reminds me of Ralph Waldo Emerson. He said, that which we persist in doing becomes easier, not because the nature of the task has changed, but our ability to do has increased. That's competence. The more you practice doing something hard, whether it's physical fitness or something else, your ability to perform becomes better. And I think, and this is something Barbell Logic explores in depth, and I recommend anybody who is wondering about the connection between getting good at something and lifting heavy things, your ability to do hard things proves to yourself your ability to do hard things and improves your ability to enter the, quote, pain cave yeah. when the going gets tough because you've shown yourself, I can do hard things. And not just go into the pain cave, but be resilient enough to come back out of it and be able to still perform. Exactly. And here's the thing about the pain cave. It cuts you off from your ability to support others. And that's where we get now into connection. That the better you become at withstanding or doing hard things, the more resilient you become, the more available you are to others, the better you are able to connect with others and help them come out of the pain cave and perform. Yeah. Another way of looking at the connection before we move on from that point is physical fitness, physical training, exercise, team sports. Those are all opportunities to connect. Yeah. We've explored that already, how sometimes unit PT, the most important function that results from that is connection. Yeah. So why not do it with something that is going to improve your character and your competence at the same time? Yeah. And one more thing to consider about that is when bodies move together, there is a connection bond there. There's a biological and psychological and social connection made between these people who exert themselves in physical movement that strengthens the connection between them. Whereas people, you know, running on treadmills at opposite ends of the room have no connection, but people who do hard things together, the same activity that is difficult together, they form a bond that wouldn't be there otherwise. Yeah, no, it's really good. 
and I think we're going to talk a little bit more about this doing this together when we get into some of our bright ideas as we go to solve all the world's problems here in a minute. That's right. <laughs> so we've really done a good job of clarifying why this matters, the real intent and purpose. And we want to bring it to the present day. So yeah. Chief Bass, recent tweet said, there shall not be any more delays in PFAs. We're starting July 1st. Make sure you're fit. End of discussion. Are you ready? Yes. That's what we're <laughs> asking. Are you ready? Yes. So for me, it's going to almost be three full years of no PFA, which is nuts to me. I still yeah. can't believe that that's happened, but I digress. I just wanted to throw this out there. The Air Force knows this is important, and their Air Force is also thinking about how to change it. Right. So we've seen reports in you know official sources that the components of the PFA are being examined. I recently got an all call through my unit that my fitness assessment cell, my FAC here with the Air Force at my current duty station is being used as one of the testing locations where mm -hmm. they're assessing what will be the new components of the PFA. So just like the officer performance report we know is changing and various different units are testing it out, doing a beta run on it, that sort of thing. They're doing that with the physical fitness test. Yes. Is that right? Yep. And I wasn't able to go and be one of the guinea pigs. Timing didn't work out for me. Man, you could have gotten this the inside I'm scoop. I'm tempted. I'm trying, but I am moving. So there's a little bit of that going on, but it's something I'm looking at. Bottom line. Ohio can wait, Reed. Why don't you tell Mrs. Gan that? And let's see how well that works for you. <laughs> anyway, the point is this matters. Yeah. This matters. PFA matters. How we measure fitness matters. The culture we create and I think for too long, I'm definitely guilty of this. You know, I've shaken my fist at the sky and been grumpy about the PFA. And I think now, Colin, we want to move to a little bit of what should it be? Yeah. Air Force is assessing what it should look like. We've said how stinking important it is that we do this. Well, what should it be if we want to create and achieve the goals as outlined in the DODI, which is to create a culture, but while also meeting a standard? That's the key. We have to do both. So. Let's start there. Yeah. Like we've said multiple times throughout this entire podcast, it's not enough to stand back, admire the big problem, throw a couple spears at it, but then offer no solutions. So my first thought, Reed, I'm just going to drop the bombshell here. I think that the physical fitness assessment as we know it should go away. It's gone. But yes, we are going to replace it. Yes. But it's not going to look the same. So. Let's bring out what are some of the components that we think should be part of this physical fitness assessment that is going to help us to create a culture of airmen who are fit and are a fit for the culture. Okay. So Reed, you and I, we think that there should be two components to this fitness assessment. In order to meet the DOTI instruction, we know that there has to be a body fat assessment. Yep. The DOTI requires it. The Air Force can't say, oh, no, never mind. We don't want that. So we got to have a body fat assessment. And we think that should happen once a year. And it should be a body fat assessment, not a BMI assessment. We're going to get away from the BMI. It's not a good measure of body composition. And let's do an actual body fat assessment. Let's leverage technology that has been developed recently, like a BOD pod or a DEXA scan or something along those lines that measures actual body fat percentage relative to lean body mass, that kind of thing. Yep. And, you know, you can even have this as part of an annual medical screening, right? We all have to do our PHA. I mean, there's yeah. tons of mechanisms for us to do this. We can make this happen. But because we have to meet that DODI, we have to meet that standard. That's got to be a part of it. But I think the interesting thing part, Colin, that we want to talk about next and probably spend more of our time on is the second and the second part of it. And you kind of hinted at you know, the importance of doing this together, doing this with others. And what we're talking about here is a points system, some sort of way in which we are tracking your fitness activity year round. And it's a cumulative score where you have to get across some baseline level of points. And yeah. there will be some varying degrees of options, right? So if you're a weightlifter, you're going to be able to submit for accomplishment towards points your workouts, and you're going to certify that you've done those. And every time you go to upload those to the system, you're going to 
you know, sign your legal life away that, yes, I completed these types of workouts. Yeah. Whether that's running or whatever, there's going to be options for you throughout the year to account for your physical activity in a way that gets you to some standard. Yeah. And this sort of system is actually already being used within the Air Force, within the Garden Reserve. There is a point system that shows that you met the requirements for a, quote, good year. And those points build up over the time for you to qualify eventually for retirement and benefits. And it's really up to the individual to build their schedule over the course of the year to achieve those points. Nobody forces them to do it, but the system is built in order to enable it and the culture is there and the expectation is there. The technology is being used to measure it. And so this is not something that's completely out of the blue. It's already being used. Yeah. So the idea also here, each unit would be also responsible for providing training opportunities for their unit to get some percentage of those points every calendar year. So that looks like unit PT, that looks like fitness training sessions with the unit where you know a PTL is going to proctor and take accountability and all that kind of thing. That also reinforces the commander's responsibilities mm -hmm. uh, because right in the Air Force manual, it says this is a commander's program, commander's responsibilities. Right. And we've already talked about the centrality of the commander in all of this, creating this culture. Yeah. The commander has to be the one who paints the vision, explains to everybody why this is important and moves everybody in the right direction. But ultimately, the individual gets to select how they participate in the program. It's owned by the commander. It's measured and executed by the commander. They're the ones who set the example and paint that vision, but the individual decides how they want to do it. Exactly. And there's a ton of variability with this. We haven't fleshed it out, you know, to the nth degree, but this could look like something like 30% of the points that you are required to achieve in a year will be provided by proctored sessions that your unit provides. That would also drive attendance at right. unit PT, because if you don't show up, you're not going to get all your points. Mm -hmm. You know, those are not free points, but in a sense, that's some you don't have to worry about on your own time, that sort of thing. So that's another idea that we've got out there. Something else, we haven't talked about what a year is. So right. we would tie the time frame that you have to accomplish your training to the closeout of your evaluation. In other words, right. when your evaluation closes out, your points counter goes to zero. Mm -hmm. And with your initial feedback session with your supervisor, leader, mentor, they're going to say, okay, what's your plan this year to accomplish your points? Yeah. Your fitness points. Yeah. Exactly. If it's, hey, I'm going to keep going to CrossFit three times a week. Cool. Sounds good. At midterm, when you do your midterm evaluation, they're going to have an opportunity to look you in the face and say, hey, 50% of the time's elapsed. And I see that you've accomplished 30% of your points. You got to get your rear in gear. Yeah. You know, what's your plan to make that up? That kind of thing. And likewise, when it comes time for your final evaluation, right before your closeout, if you have met the standard, you've met the standard. And they'll be able to reflect that in your evaluation. And if you haven't, you will get a referral because you will have failed one of the two physical components of your fitness assessment. And this, again, gives the opportunity, the responsibility to the commander to outline those expectations, to provide regular feedback to the officers. Officers can do that for their NCOs. NCOs can do that for their junior airmen. And then the individual airmen, junior airmen, NCO, officer, wherever they fall, can take individual responsibility and participate in it however they want. But it's their plan that is then held accountable by the command structure. It makes great sense to me. I think something else that's really important with this is it's year round. Yes. There's a focus year round. Yeah. How often do we hear about people saying, oh, my PT test is coming up in two weeks. I better start running. All the time. Guilty as charged. <laughs> I'll be honest because I don't do things. I don't train for my physical fitness assessment. Right. Because it's part of your culture. Yes. I train other things. But then when it's February, I'm a May tester traditionally, 
I'm like, oh, I guess I better start specifically training for the PFA. Yeah. And this will lead to a year round focus, a year round conversation. And I think that's, again, the objective is creating a culture of fitness and meet a physical fitness standard as outlined by the DODI and ensuring your availability and capability of the mission. Colin, there's other things we haven't talked about, but, you know, just imagine if, you know, think about like the Apple Watch and its act activity tracker. You know, that's kind yeah. of the points that we're talking about. Imagine if it says, hey, if I get 20,000 steps on my Fitbit every day, I'll get the numbers. Yeah, and the you data can, is there. Yeah, and you can submit your data. You know, you take your Garmin on a run and you submit your GPS data, you know, and just say, hey, look, this is me accomplishing my points. You get your points, right? Sorry, Reed. I just have this picture in my mind of CAC-enabled Apple Watches Hey, so that we could submit our data. I'm trying to be hopeful here, Colin. Come on, man. <laughs> How many times have we already ragged on Air Force IT? But let's lean into it. Let's leverage technology. No, we should. Absolutely. Let's do this. We should absolutely do this. If the Air Force wants to buy me an Apple Watch, I'm listening. Give me a call. You know where to reach me. They're going to send you a Fitbit. Okay, whatever. <laughs> that, you know, I'm listening. But the point no, is... You're making a great point. Yeah. If that's what it takes to create a culture of fitness and it increases the availability of airmen, that's the mission. And that's what we should do. This is our rough proposal. We are interested in your spears, your thoughts. Yes, you're going to have some airmen, you know, hook their Air Force provided Fitbit to their cat and chase them around the house and say, look at all these steps I got. And when we find out that that happens, we're going to kick them out just as much as we would if they were lying about a training report or the availability of an aircraft, right? Yeah. Integrity first. No questions. For sure. And it's also going to be really hard to pass your, your uh, body fat requirement if that's what you're doing. You're not going to get there. Yeah. Maybe some lucky genetic freaks are, but that's not me. So that's kind of what we're talking about. Before we move on, Colin, any other thoughts on, you know, kind of our big proposal? What I like about it is that it brings back the new officer performance report being evaluated by various different stakeholders. The individual has a piece. The commander has a piece. The people around you, your coworkers, your fellow airmen, they have a piece through the unit PT and proctored activity. So I like that aspect of it as well. And then big picture, just like I got into in the episode, in the interview with Matt, that it has both the bottom up and the top down working together towards a common goal. There is the grassroots effort to choose the things that are important to them, the physical fitness activities that are important to them. But then it's also reinforced and, and supported by budget and policy at the Air Force level. So I like that there's the combination of those two different ways of making this happen. Yeah. And that's the Again, we need to establish a culture of fitness, not a three-week culture of hurry up and get my push-ups ready fitness. And I know the Air Force is looking at this. I don't know what it's going to look like. Do I think a physical fitness assessment is going to go away? Right now, I don't envision that. I think that would be exciting. I'm listening. You know, anybody at A1? Well, the DOTI won't let the assessment go away. There will always be an assessment unless the DOTI changes. The Air Force must comply with that. I'm talking that test. I'm talking that 6 a.m. wake up and show up in my PT gear. And, you know, I don't think that's going to go away. But I think there's some reasons to think that there's options out there. And I think that would be interesting to explore. What do you think, audience? Why don't you chip in instead of just shaking your fist at the sky? What do you think a new PFA or a physical fitness assessment system should look like? Yeah. You know, we've thrown our ideas out there. Join us on our social media accounts, send us some emails. You know, when we put this episode out there, start the conversation in your units. Because again, who owns this, Colin? We do. We own this, right? Especially the officers own this. Yes, especially us. It is our responsibility to create that culture. And just like I put, you know, that hypothetical rhetorical question up earlier, where are you? Do you have a culture of fitness? Does your unit and those responsible that you are responsible for have one because that's on you. Yeah. Great. Well, Reed, we have covered so much ground over the last few episodes. And we've solved everything. Everything's fine now. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Well, not really. But anyway, we are going to, as promised, bring you 
a final conversation on fitness. It's the importance of a culture of fitness and moving into a culture of trust with the CEO, founder and owner of Barbell Logic, Matt Reynolds. Super excited to share his insights with everybody. And once again, hope that you will share this episode with your network, with people around you, bring them into the conversation so that they can share their insights, they can get some new insights, and we can all take greater ownership of this and make things better for the Air Force and ultimately for the American people, because that's why we do this. Awesome. Thanks, Colin. And that'll do it from us. Thanks for joining us for this week's episode of Commission Ed. Commission Ed.